Dams provide society with many essential benefits, such as water supply, flood control, irrigation, hydropower, and recreation. However, a dam can fail or breach, allowing the stored water to escape into the downstream valley. This can cause catastrophic flooding with destruction of property and possible deaths as a result. Usually, the magnitude of the flow downstream of the breach dam greatly exceeds all previous floods. Warning time for a dam breach flood is much shorter and is frequently totally lacking. In the United States, there are nearly 40,000 dams of heights greater than 25 feet, with over 14,000 of these located so that a dam failure poses a significant threat to human life and property. These dams have varying risk of failure due to inadequate spillway capacity, structural weakness, or earthquake damage. Many of the dams are more than 50 years old and present increased hazard potential due to additional downstream development, structural deterioration caused by age, and or inadequate ongoing inspection and maintenance. In the last 150 years, there have been several hundred significant dam failures in the U.S. and many other countries. In the U.S., significant dam breach floods occurred in Johnstown, Pennsylvania in 1889 and below the St. Francis Dam in California in 1928. Both resulted in many deaths and significant destruction of property. In the 1970s, significant dam breach floods occurred downstream of the Teton Dam in Idaho and below the Buffalo Creek Coal Waste Dam in West Virginia. In fact, many dam breach floods occur every year. The possibility of dam breaches resulting in death and destruction depend on many factors, such as the cause of the breach, the time of the day, the magnitude of the resulting flood, property development and population downstream of the dam, warning time available for the downstream population, and the size and shape of the downstream river valley. These factors will be explored in this presentation entitled Dam Breach Floods. The Federal Interagency Committee on Dam Safety invited Dr. Danny Fred, a world-renowned expert in the field of river modeling, to make this presentation. It consists of an introduction to the basic characteristics of dam breach floods, followed by a more in-depth discussion of dam breach flood prediction by computer modeling. Dr. Fred has developed several computer models to aid engineers and hydrologists in predicting dam breach flooding. These models are known as dam break, simple dam break, breach, and flood wave. They have been used extensively during the last 25 years for hazard mitigation planning, hydraulic analysis and design for numerous dams in the United States and many other countries. Dr. Fred received his Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy in 1961. He then worked several years in private industry where he designed pressurized fluid flow and gravity sewer systems. Subsequently, he returned to the University of Missouri at Rolla for graduate studies in hydrology, hydraulics, and mathematics. His research focused on the hydraulics of dam breach flows using both experimental and mathematical simulation approaches. After receiving his doctorate in 1971, he accepted a position as a research hydrologist with the National Weather Service at their hydrologic research laboratory in Silver Spring, Maryland. Dr. Fred spent the next three decades performing research and development work to create mathematical computer simulation models for predicting unsteady flow in rivers, including the very important application to dam breach floods. While developing these models, he extended theoretical hydraulic principles and combined these with practical engineering judgment. He also developed several numerical analysis and mathematical techniques for efficiently solving the complex equations of unsteady flow. He implemented these principles and techniques in his work by developing computer models with effective, reliable computer code. He also tested the computer programs using numerous case studies to assess their accuracy and verify the reliability of each model. During his early years with the National Weather Service, he developed a computer simulation model called Dynamic Wave Operational. 
It was designed for hydrologists and engineers to more accurately predict unstudied flow conditions in a system of rivers during flooding caused by storm runoff or hurricanes. The model was first tested on portions of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers, and in 1977, it was adopted by the National Weather Service for daily river forecasting operations. It was later adapted for many rivers in the United States and throughout the world. Immediately after the breaching of Teton Dam in 1976, he was asked by his agency to develop a computer model that could simulate the failure of a dam and the subsequent downstream flooding. It was to be used by agency hydrologists to provide the public with appropriate flood forecasts. With this directive, he expanded his PhD research and combined it with the research that produced the dynamic wave operational model. The results were used to develop a new computer model known as dam break. A few years later, he developed a simplified dam break model that could be used on a handheld calculator. This was necessary because not all agency forecasters at that time could access the mainframe computer that ran the dam break model. Later, he developed the breach model to assist federal agencies in hazard mitigation planning for the possible breaching of the Spirit Lake blockage that had been caused by the Mount St. Helens volcanic eruption. Soon after, he modified the model to also apply to the simulation of the failure of earth dams by erosion due to overtopping or piping flows. With appropriate available data, the breach model can provide improved estimates of breach characteristics used in the dam break and simple dam break models. He then developed the flood wave model that combines the capabilities of the dynamic wave operational and dam break models and introduces many additional modeling features and improvements. These models have been used by many federal and state agencies, engineering consulting firms, the hydropower and mining industries, educators and researchers throughout the United States, Canada, and numerous nations throughout the world. To date, Dr. Fred has conducted 130 continuing education seminars on the practical use of these models for over 3,500 engineers and hydrologists. He has also authored over 90 professional papers on dam breach flood modeling and study flow in rivers and hydrologic forecasting. By invitation, he has also contributed chapters on this subject to several engineering handbooks. In 1979, Dr. Fred was awarded the Department of Commerce's highest award, the Gold Medal, for his contributions to hydrologic engineering and the development and implementation of new computer models for predicting the nation's river flows with improved accuracy. He received two awards from the American Society of Civil Engineers, the Walter L. Huber Civil Engineering Research Prize and the J.C. Stevens Award for his research in the hydraulics of unsteady open channel flow. He received the Federal Laboratory Consortium Special Award for Excellence in Technology Transfer for the dissemination and training he provided to support public use of the National Weather Service models. More recently, he received the National Award of Merit from the Association of State Dam Safety Officials for his contributions in dam breach flood prediction, and he was elected a fellow in the American Meteorological Society. In 1988, Dr. Fred became chief of the Hydrologic Research Laboratory. There he led a staff of hydrologic researchers and computer software specialists in the ongoing development and support of a comprehensive river and flood forecasting computer modeling system. In 1995, he became the director of the Office of Hydrology of the National Weather Service. In this position, he directed the Hydrologic Research Laboratory and a staff of hydrologists who provided policy and technical support in flood forecasting for a network of National Weather Service river forecast offices. He retired at the end of 1999 and has since been involved in a variety of consulting projects concerned with dam breach flood modeling and unsteady flow in rivers. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Danny Fred for his presentation on dam breach and flood wave modeling. Dr. Fred.
Thank you, Dr. McLean. I would also like to thank ICODS for the opportunity to make this presentation. The potential for catastrophic flooding due to the breaching of dams was brought to the attention of politicians, emergency action personnel, engineers, and portions of the general populace within the United States during the 1970s by several catastrophic floods due to dam failures. These were the 1972 Buffalo Creek Dam Breach Flood in West Virginia that caused 125 deaths and over $50 million in damages. The 1976 Teton Dam Breach Flood in Idaho which resulted in 11 fatalities and over 400 million in property damages. The 1977 Laurel Run Dam Breach Flood in Pennsylvania that resulted in 40 lives lost. And the 1977 Kelly Barnes Dam Breach Flood in Georgia that caused 39 fatalities. Prior to this period in our nation's history, there were many other dam breach floods. The most significant were the 1889 Johnstown, Pennsylvania Dam Breach Flood which caused 2,209 deaths and destroyed much of Johnstown. The 1928 St. Francis Dam Breach Flood in California, where 420 people lost their lives. The St. Francis Dam Breach resulted in the first enactment of state law regarding dam safety. The Dam Breach Floods of the 1970s were the impetus for the enactment of federal legislation and funding for dam safety, which is mostly administered by individual state governments. Each year in the U.S., many dams fail. More than 200 small dams failed in Georgia as a result of heavy storm runoff from Hurricane Alberto in 1994. And Hurricane Fran caused numerous dam failures in 1996 in North Carolina. In the last two years, 22 dams have failed, including the very recent breach of the 57 feet high Big Bay Lake Dam in Mississippi. In the U.S., as well as worldwide, the great majority of dams are earth fill construction. They can range in height from less than 25 feet to over 600 feet. This is an example of an earth fill dam. The dam is about 30 feet high. Another example of a much higher earth fill dam is this one, which is about 300 feet high. Also earth fill dams can be very wide. Some earth fill dams can extend several thousand feet across a river valley. Some dams have been constructed of rock fill. They are similar to earth fill dams in shape and size. Concrete dams make up a small percentage of all dams. Concrete dams can be a thin arch dam like this one, or a much thicker arch dam like this one, or they can be a gravity dam like this one, or a gravity buttress dam as shown here. Infrequently, naturally formed landslide dams are created when a landslide is deposited such that it blocks a river. Usually this occurs in mountainous terrain and the landslide formed dam is usually much larger in volume than an earth fill dam of similar height. Overtopping of a dam can cause a dam breach to develop if the overtopping flow is sufficient in magnitude and duration. When a dam fails, the opening formed in the dam through which the stored water escapes into the downstream valley is called a breach. The mechanics of breach formation are only partially understood for earth fill dams and even less for concrete dams. Dam breaches are usually caused by overtopping, piping, or foundation failures. Data on dam failures in the U.S. and worldwide indicate that about 40 percent of all dam breaches occur because the stored water sufficiently overtops the dam due to inadequate spillway capacity. One third of all dam breaches occur due to internal dam leakage from piping and seepage. About one fifth of dam breaches are the result of foundation failures. And the remaining approximately 5% of dam failures primarily result from embankment slides, earthquake liquefaction, and spillway failures. A dam breach caused by overtopping is shown in this sequence of illustrations. First, the water stored behind the dam begins overflowing the top of the dam and along the downstream face of the dam. At the toe of the dam, some erosion and head cutting begins to occur. In the next sequence, the erosion and head cutting progresses from bottom to top along the entire downstream face and a significant portion has been eroded away. If the reservoir inflow had previously ceased, causing overtopping flow to stop at this time, the dam would be damaged but a dam breach would be averted. 
However, if sufficient overtopping continues, as shown here, the erosion of the downstream face progresses backwards across the crest of the dam to a point where erosion is beginning to occur on the upstream face of the dam. It is at this point in time that actual breaching of the dam commences. As the erosion proceeds further in time from this point, more and more water will be able to escape from the reservoir through the breach as it forms on the upstream face of the dam. The rate of erosion will begin to accelerate from this time forward. As illustrated in the next sequence, the erosion of the upstream face begins and an increasing quantity of water is escaping through the breach. The time rate of water flowing into the breach forming on the upstream face can be approximated as broad-crested weir flow, a type of rapidly varied spatial flow. In the next sequence, the erosion further accelerates. A wider and deeper breach of the upstream face is occurring and the rate of flow escaping through the breach has increased. In the next sequences, most of the upstream face of the dam is shown as eroded, as well as the remaining inner portions of the dam, resulting in an even greater rate of flow through the breach. In the next sequence of illustrations, the previous breaching process, due to overtopping, is viewed from a location within the reservoir with the breach formation darkened for emphasis. This view of the breach formation of the upstream face of the dam illustrates the gradual erosion of the breach in the approximate shape of a trapezoid. The erosion rate gradually accelerates until the breach reaches the bottom of the dam. Then the breach formation gradually decelerates as the flow rate decreases due to the large rate of breach outflow, which in turn increases the rate at which the reservoir water level lowers. The next sequence shows a breach being formed by piping through the dam. The water stored behind the dam can be at various levels at the initiation of a piping form breach. However, higher reservoir levels provide a greater waterhead pressure to produce sufficient water velocities within the initial pipe erosion channel to become critical and accelerate to cause breaching of the dam. The initial piping channel location is dependent on a weakness within the dam due to a multitude of causes, such as poor construction, porous abutments, improper drain pipe design and or installation, animal burrows, tree roots, etc. In the second sequence, the piping channel penetrates through the dam and the escaping water is producing slow, continual erosion along the interior walls of the pipe. And at the same time, some erosion is occurring along the downstream face of the dam. In the next sequence, the pipe further enlarges due to an accelerating rate of erosion. Also, more significant erosion along the downstream face is occurring. The amount of water entering the pipe is controlled by the area of the pipe opening at the upstream face of the dam. In the next two sequences, the erosion proceeds further. This results in a much larger pipe opening being formed and more erosion damaged to the downstream face of the dam. This type of flow can be approximated as pipe flow through a short tube. In the next sequence, the top of the dam has collapsed and the flow through the breach has increased and changed from pipe flow to broad crested weir flow. This in turn will increase the erosion rate of the breach. In the final sequence, almost all of the upstream face of the dam has eroded away and the maximum rate of broad crested weir flow is occurring through the breach in the dam. Viewing the piping formation from a location upstream of the dam, this sequence of illustrations depicts the pipe initially forming in the middle of the dam and then gradually enlarging in all directions until the top of the dam collapses. Then erosion proceeds vertically and laterally forming a slightly trapezoidal shaped opening. Dam breaches caused by foundation failures are illustrated in this sequence. First, a concrete dam is subjected to foundation failure. Next, the resulting dam breach forms very rapidly. The dam has broken up and cross sections have overturned and been pushed downstream due to a combination of forces produced by pressure, gravity, and the force of the escaping water. During the breach formation, some monolithic constructed sections of the dam may remain in place, while others are displaced to locations just downstream of the dam. In this situation, the flow through the breach can still be approximated as broad crested weir flow. Dam breaches caused by an embankment slide are illustrated in this sequence. Initially, most of the downstream face of the dam is shown 
as having been removed or displaced by an embankment slide. The stored water begins to flow out and erodes the remaining downstream face and a portion of the upstream face of the dam. The erosion of the upstream face is accelerated as more and more water enters into the breach. Finally, only a small portion of the upstream face of the dam is shown to remain. The flow in this type of breach is best approximated as broad-crested weir flow. A dam breach can be caused by earthquake liquefaction of the dam as illustrated in this sequence. The material of an earth-filled dam can liquefy due to the shaking motion created by the earthquake. The liquefied material begins to flow or displace due to the pressure of its own weight and that of the impounded water. Water from the reservoir enters the displaced portions of the dam and the resulting broad-crested weir flow proceeds very rapidly to erode the remaining portion of the dam. The width of a dam breach as measured from one side of the valley to the other side can be the complete width of the dam or only a partial width of the dam. An example of a complete breach is the St. Francis Dam in California. Once failure started somewhere near the center of the concrete gravity dam, it proceeded in both directions across the entire width of the dam. The breaching of earth fill dams usually extends only over a portion of the entire width of the dam. These are called partial breaches. The Teton Dam breach is an example of a partial breach. Other examples of partial breaches are the Bear Wallow Dam in North Carolina and the Renegade Dam in Tennessee. Dam breach shapes can vary from triangular to trapezoidal to rectangular. A triangular shaped breach is associated with some piping failures, particularly in earth fill dams with very small volume reservoirs. Most earth fill dams tend to have a trapezoidal shape breach. However, some earth fill dams have breaches that approach a more rectangular shape. This is a case when the dam materials are highly cohesive and well compacted. Also, a rectangular shaped breach is usually the best representation for the breach shape of a concrete dam. Dam breaches are formed during a period or interval of time. However, the time period may be only a few minutes, such as breaches associated with a concrete arch dam. Breach formation in earth fill dams and concrete gravity dams will take a somewhat longer period of time. For earth fill dams, the breach is the opening formed in the dam, which produces an increasing amount of outflow to occur. The time required for erosion of materials in the region of the downstream face of an earth fill dam is not a part of the breach formation time. The actual breach formation time, denoted as T sub F, for earth fill dams can be anywhere from a few minutes to an hour or more. Using data from 63 historical dam breaches, a statistical correlation of the breach formation time, T sub F, with the reservoir volume and the depth above the final breach bottom can be formulated. In this correlation, T sub F expressed in hours is equal to 0.3 multiplied by the reservoir volume, V sub R, expressed in units of acre feet, raised to the 0.53 power, and then divided by H, the initial water depth in feet above the breach bottom, raised to the 0.9 power. An example of a gradual breach formation is illustrated in the piping breach of the Teton Dam in 1976. This rare capture of an actual real-time breach formation begins when a small pipe breach flow begins on the downstream face of the dam at about 10 in the morning. It is located near the left abutment as viewed from just downstream of the dam. It is about 130 feet below the top of the dam and about 90 feet below the reservoir water level behind the dam. In the next photo, the pipe has grown in size such that there is a significant increase in flow from the pipe breach onto the downstream face of the dam. The pipe breach flow gradually increases, as illustrated in the next two photos, until about 11.50 in the morning, when the pipe has grown substantially to over 100 feet in width. A few minutes later, the top of the dam has collapsed, whereupon the breach flow changes from piping flow to broad-crested weir flow. During the next 50 minutes, the breach continues to grow very rapidly, reaching a top width of approximately 620 feet and an average width from top to bottom of about 350 feet.
The dam breach outflow raced down a narrow 1,200 foot wide canyon extending about five miles downstream of the dam. Depths within the canyon varied from about 75 feet near the dam to about 60 feet near the end of the canyon, while maximum velocities were about 30 feet per second. Exiting from the canyon, the water spread onto the wide, flat floodplain to a width of about nine miles and flooded the towns of Wilford, Sugar City, and a portion of Rexburg, located nine to 15 miles below the dam. In this graphic, the concept of the added potential catastrophic flooding due to the presence of a dam is represented as the shaded area downstream of the dam. This added potential flooding is called a dam breach shadow. It represents flooding that would be in excess of any natural precipitation runoff flooding that would occur if the breach dam had not been there. A way of understanding the magnitude of a dam breach flood is to focus on the time rate of breach outflow. The time dependent flow starts out small, becomes larger and larger, always reaching a peak or maximum rate of outflow, and then gradually reduces. This is illustrated in this plot of breach flow versus time. Such a plot is called a dam breach flow hydrograph. The vertical axis represents the rate of breach outflow in cubic feet per second. The horizontal axis represents the time expressed in hours. Each particular value of time is associated with a particular rate of breach outflow. The dam breach flow hydrograph starts out small, rises to a peak value that is denoted as Q sub P, and then recedes gradually to a reduced rate of flow as the reservoir drains through the breach. The time at which the peak flow Q sub P occurs is denoted by T sub P. The concept of the time dependent maximum breach flow Q sub P emanating from a dam breach at time T sub P is useful as we examine the properties of dam breach floods. A primary characteristic of a dam breach flood is its peak flow, Q sub P, since this directly produces the peak depth that the dam breach flood will reach. This peak depth will cause a maximum height of flooding at the various locations downstream. The destruction caused by a dam breach flood increases with the height of the flood wave. The magnitude of the peak flow is directly proportional to the height of the dam, or more specifically, the depth of water denoted by H stored above the bottom of the dam. The peak breach outflow, Q sub P, is well approximated by broad-crested weir flow. This type of rapidly varied spatial flow is empirically described by the relation Q sub P equals three times W sub B times H sub W raised to the three halves power in which Q sub P is rate of flow, the constant three is the empirical discharge coefficient, W sub B is the average width of the weir, and H sub W is the depth of water above the terminal breach bottom. W sub B and H sub W are expressed in units of feet, and Q sub P is expressed in cubic feet per second. Both W sub B and H sub W occur at the time at which the breach is completely formed. This relationship applies to both earth fill and concrete dams. For concrete arch dams, W sub B is usually equal to the full width of the dam. However, for concrete gravity or buttress dams, W sub B can be much smaller. For earth fill dams, the average breach width W sub B can be empirically correlated to the initial depth of water H in units of feet and volume of the reservoir V sub R in units of acre feet above the breach bottom at the beginning of the breach. A statistical correlation for 63 dam breaches provides the following estimator. W sub B is equal to 9.5 times the coefficient K sub zero multiplied by a quantity V sub R times H. This quantity is raised to the one fourth power. The coefficient K sub zero is equal to one for overtopping failures or 0 0.7 for piping failures. As an example, the breach width for an overtopping failure of a 50 foot high earth fill dam with a reservoir volume of 2,000 acre feet is computed as 9.5 times 1.0 times the quantity 2,000 times 50 raised to the one fourth power. This gives a value of 170 feet for W sub B. Also, 
A very simple relationship has been developed for earth fill breaches. This simple relation is H is less than W sub B is less than 5H with a mean value of W sub B equal to about 3 times H. Using this simple relation gives a value of 150 feet for W sub B. A critical value in determining the peak breach flow is the depth of water H sub W that is above the terminal breach bottom when the breach is fully formed. An expression for this critical depth is given by the following. H sub W is equal to the square of a quantity C divided by another quantity T sub F plus C divided by the square root of H. This is applicable for all dams. In this relationship, T sub F is the duration of time in hours required for the breach to fully form. H is the initial depth in feet of water above the final breach bottom elevation as the breach begins to form at the top of the dam. C is equal to 23.4 times the reservoir surface area, S sub A, expressed in acres, divided by the average breach width, W sub B. It is apparent that a larger breach width W sub B will produce a larger peak breach flow, Q sub P, and that a smaller W sub B produces a smaller Q sub P. However, the influence of the breach formation time T sub F on the peak breach flow is not as apparent, although it is contained within the expression for H sub W, which does greatly affect the peak flow because H sub W is raised to the 3 halves power. In fact, a longer breach formation time actually produces a smaller peak flow. This is so because as the dam breach forms, the outflow through the breach reduces the reservoir storage behind the dam, resulting in a reduction of the reservoir water level. The rate of broadcrested wear flow through the breach is proportional to the depth of the water above the breach bottom. Therefore, as the breach forms, the water level reduces, and when the breach is fully formed, the resulting depth of water is less than if the breach had formed instantaneously or at a faster rate. The smaller depth of water available to produce flow through the breach when it completely forms in both the vertical and horizontal directions results in a smaller peak outflow. The extent of flood peak reduction due to a longer failure time is inversely proportional to the magnitude of the reservoir storage volume. As an example, suppose the time of failure T sub F is estimated to be 0.5 hours. H is 50 feet, the surface area S sub A is 60 acres, and W sub B is 150 feet. The expression for C is computed as 23.4 times 60 divided by 150, which gives a value of 9.4. Then using the expression for H sub W, we take the C value of 9.4 and divide it by the quantity 0.5 plus 9.4 divided by the square root of 50. This computation gives a value of 5.14. Then squaring this value gives 26 feet for H sub W. If the water surface is at the top of the dam when the breach begins forming, then as the breach forms and finally reaches the bottom of the dam and is fully formed, the depth of water above the breach bottom has decreased from an original depth of 50 feet to a depth of only 26 feet. Therefore, there has been a 24-foot lowering of the water surface. As another example, suppose T sub F is increased to 1.0 hour. Using the same values for H, W sub B, and S sub A as before, H sub W is computed as only 16.3 feet, which is considerably smaller than the previously computed value of 26 feet for H sub W when T sub F was 0.5 hours. In this example, Q sub P would be equal to 3 times W sub B times H sub W raised to the 3 halves power. Substitution of 150 feet for W sub B and 26 feet for H sub W gives a value of 60,000 cubic feet per second for Q sub P. Also, various statistical correlations of historic dam breach data have been proposed in order to estimate dam breach peak flow for earth fill dams. One of the best of these statistical correlations estimates Q sub P to be equal to 39.6 times the volume of the reservoir V sub R raised to the 0.3 power times the initial height of water H 
above the bottom of the dam raised to the 1.25 power. As an example, suppose V sub R is equal to 2,000 acre feet and H is 50 feet. Therefore, Q sub P would be equal to 39.6 times the quantity 2,000 raised to the 0 0.3 power times 50 raised to the 1.25 power. This computes to be 51,500 cubic feet per second compared to the value of 60,000 cubic feet per second computed by the hydraulic method. In these particular examples, both the hydraulic and statistical correlation methods agree within about 7% of a mean value of 55,000 cubic feet per second. However, the two methods can produce much larger differences. The statistical correlation method is only applicable for determining the peak dam breach flow. The hydraulic method is applicable for computing the whole range of time-dependent breach flows making up breach flow hydrographs. The hydraulic method for determining peak flow has been used as a basic component of the NWS models dam break and flood wave since these models simulate the breach flow hydrograph and its progression through the downstream valley. The peak dam breach flow, Q sub P, can be affected by the tailwater depth, H sub T, just downstream of the breach dam. If H sub T is large enough, it can reduce Q sub P due to submergence. This is accounted for by correcting the peak dam breach flow using a broad crested weir submergence correction factor, K sub S. The corrected peak discharge, Q sub P, is obtained by simply multiplying it by the K sub S factor. This correction is necessary only when the tailwater depth is high enough to affect the free-flowing properties of the broad-crested wear equation. The value of K sub S is dependent on the ratio of the tailwater, H sub T, above the breach bottom, to the depth of the water, H sub W, above the terminal breach bottom at the upstream face of the dam. If the ratio H sub T over H sub W is less than or equal to two-thirds, K sub S will equal one. If the ratio is greater than two-thirds, K sub S will vary from 0 0.7 to zero, as the ratio varies from two-thirds to one. The tailwater depth, H sub T, is a function of the peak flow, Q sub P, coming through the breach. It is also a function of the cross-sectional area A of the river valley just below the dam, the bottom slope, S sub M, of the downstream reach of river valley, and the frictional resistance to flow of the downstream river valley as described by the value of the Manning roughness coefficient, N. It is also a function of any possible backwater effects due to the constriction of flow produced by the presence of downstream bridges or dams or natural constrictions in the river valley cross sections downstream of the dam. The depth immediately downstream of a breach dam can be roughly approximated if, one, the dam is assumed to breach completely and instantaneously, and if, two, any friction effects and backwater effects in the downstream river valley are neglected. In this case, the maximum depth is approximately equal to one-half of the initial depth H of water behind the dam. The assumption of a complete instantaneous breach can cause the depth to be over-approximated by as much as 50 to 100 percent. Another characteristic of dam breach floods is their temporal properties. One temporal property is the breach initiation time, T sub zero, which is the initial interval of time that a dam is undergoing damages but not actually being breached. Also, the breach formation time, T sub F, is another temporal feature of dam breach floods. As previously discussed, T sub F is the elapsed time from when the breach first begins to form until the breach becomes fully formed. As the breach gradually forms, an increasing rate of flow escapes through the breach. For concrete dams, the breach initiation time, T sub zero, is equal to the time required for the overtopping flow to undermine the foundation of the downstream toe of the dam. This causes structural weakening and failure of the dam, resulting in the subsequent breaching of the dam. For concrete arch dams, the time of breach formation, T sub F, is usually estimated to be less than or about 0.05 to 0.15 hours. This depends on the particular size of dam and the type of dam, thin arch or thick arch. For concrete gravity dams, the time of breach formation is estimated as the total time required for several concrete monolithic sections to sequentially fail. 
It is difficult to estimate the total number of sections that will fail. To aid in making this estimate, it should be recognized that the water level could lower substantially during the time allowed for each monolithic section to fail, such that continuation to complete failure of the dam would not likely occur. This is particularly relevant for small reservoirs. The extent of water level lowering is dependent on H sub W, S sub A, and the width of each monolithic section. The larger the value of H sub W, the smaller the value of S sub A, and the larger the value of the section width produces a greater lowering of the water level. For earth fill dams, T sub zero is the time required for the overtopping flow to erode the downstream face of the dam such that an eroded channel is cut back far enough into the dam so that the upstream face is just starting to erode. In this graphic, the erosion is progressing on the downstream dam face and subsequently progressing toward the upstream face such that the section denoted as BB is the point in the erosion process when the breach formation time, T sub F, begins. Further erosion would cause an increasing rate of flow through the initially forming breach on the upstream face. In fact, the time of the breach formation, T sub F, is the duration of time required for the upstream face to erode to the bottom of the dam. T sub zero is the initial portion of the breach hydrograph at the dam. The breach flow is usually relatively constant during the T sub zero interval of time. T sub F is the rising portion of the hydrograph. The time to peak, T sub P, of the breach flow hydrograph is the sum of T sub zero and T sub F. The peak flow Q sub P usually occurs at time T sub P, which is at the end of the time interval of breach formation T sub F. An exception to this is a reservoir of very small storage volume with a relatively high dam. In this case, the peak can occur before the end of T sub F because the reservoir level drops more rapidly than the rate at which the breach forms. The other exception is a reservoir of very large volume with a relatively low dam. In this case, the reservoir level is very slowly lowering while the breach erodes to the bottom of the dam. After this point in the breach formation, the breach continues to erode laterally until the peak flow occurs. This maximum rate of breach flow occurs when the rate of lowering of the reservoir level exceeds the rate that the breach is widening. In this case, T sub F actually represents both the point at which the breach erodes to the bottom of the dam as well as the point of maximum breach width formation. Another temporal property of the dam breach flood is the recession portion of the flood hydrograph denoted in this graphic of the breach hydrograph as T sub R. T sub R is the period of time for the breach flow to decrease from Q sub P to an insignificant value. This decrease or recession is the time for the remaining reservoir stories to gradually drain through the breach at a decreasing rate of flow as the reservoir level lowers. The total duration of the flood hydrograph, T sub D, is the sum of T sub P and T sub R. Another characteristic of the dam breach flood is the speed or velocity denoted as C sub P at which the peak flow Q sub P travels through the downstream river valley. This characteristic is vital for estimating available warning time for the downstream populace. The concept of C sub P is illustrated in a hydrograph plot of flow Q versus time T for two dam break hydrographs. At the dam, the hydrograph represents the dam breach flow emanating from the breach dam with the peak flow occurring at time T sub P1. 10 miles below the dam, the breach flow hydrograph is plotted with its peak flow Q sub P2 occurring at time T sub P2. A general definition of the peak flow travel speed, C sub P, is the distance that the flood travels divided by duration of the time of travel. In this case, C sub P is equal to 10 miles divided by the travel time, which is given by the difference between T sub P2 and T sub P1 measured in hours. Thus, C sub P would be expressed in units of miles per hour. A general expression for estimating C sub P is the following. C sub P is approximately equal to 0.023 times the average depth along the river reach raised to the two-thirds power, multiplied by the square root of the downstream river bed slope, S sub M, expressed in feet per mile, and finally divided by the Manning roughness coefficient, N, for the river reach. This approximation has been further simplified 
such that c sub p can be roughly estimated to be 2 times the square root of the bottom slope s sub m of the river reach. As an example, the wave speed c sub p is estimated as follows. If s sub m is equal to 5 feet per mile, c sub p is estimated as 2 times the square root of 5, or about 4.5 miles per hour. Another characteristic of dam breach floods is their travel time, t sub t. The travel time is the elapsed time it takes for the peak dam breach flow to reach a particular point of interest downstream of the dam. In this example, the travel time, t sub t, for the flood peak to reach a location 10 miles downstream of the dam is computed as 10 miles divided by the peak flow travel speed, c sub p, which is 4.5 miles per hour. This computes to be just over two hours for the travel time of the flood to reach mile 10. A very important characteristic of dam breach floods is the attenuation or decrease in the peak flow as the flood travels through the downstream river valley. The attenuation of the peak flow is illustrated in this particular example by the hydrographs representing the time history of the dam breach flow at the following locations, mile zero at the dam and other downstream locations denoted as mile five, mile 10, mile 20, and mile 30. The peak flow of each of the hydrographs becomes smaller as the dam breach flood progresses downstream. In this example, there is a rapid decrease in the peak flow from mile zero to about mile seven downstream of the dam. Then a much slower decrease in the peak flow occurs as the flood travels on downstream to mile 30. In this case, the peak flow is decreasing in the downstream direction at a decreasing exponential rate. In another graphic illustrating flood peak attenuation, the peak flow is plotted against the distance downstream of the dam. The lower curve, labeled B, is a decreasing exponential curve. This is typical of a dam breach flood traveling through a wide downstream valley. Also, the bed of the river in this type of attenuation tends to be a mile to flat slope, or about 15 feet per mile to one half foot per mile. If the valley is rather narrow and the river is steep, the attenuation can be much less, as shown by the upper curve, labeled A, that is more straight or linear with distance from the dam. As a general rule, the more narrow and or steeper the river, the attenuation of the dam breach flood will be smaller and the rate of attenuation will be more linear with distance. The final characteristic of interest for dam breach floods is the dispersion or spreading out of the flood hydrograph over time. This feature is illustrated in the plot of the breach flow versus time where three dam breach flow hydrographs are depicted at mile zero, mile 10, and mile 30. Notice that the time to peak, T sub P zero, increases as the flood moves from mile zero to mile 10. As it proceeds further downstream to mile 30, T sub P 30 is considerably larger than the other T sub P values. Also, the time of recession, T sub R, of each of the hydrograph increases as the flood travels downstream from the dam. There have been several significant dam breach floods in the U.S., starting with the Johnstown Flood of 1889, which was caused by the overtopping of the 72-foot high South Fork Dam. The Earth Fill Dam failed at 3 in the afternoon, and there was very limited warning time for the populace downstream along the Little Connemaw River. This dam breach flood caused 2,209 fatalities which corresponded to about 13% of those who lived within the flooded downstream area. Over 80% of the victims lived in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which was located 14 miles downstream of the dam. In 1928, the St. Francis Dam, a 180-foot high concrete gravity dam, failed at midnight. There were no warnings given. This dam breach flood caused 420 fatalities. In 1972, the Buffalo Creek Coal Waste Dam failed. It was a 44-foot high pile of disposed coal waste material that blocked a small drainage ravine in West Virginia. The coal waste dam breached due to heavy rains and inadequate spillway capacity that produced overtopping at 8 in the morning. The warning time was at most just a few minutes. The dam breach flood caused 125 fatalities. 
In 1976, the Teton Dam failed. This earth fill dam was 305 feet high. However, the reservoir was in the process of its first filling and the water level was only 262 feet above the bottom of the dam when the dam began breaching due to piping at about noon. The warning time was from one to two hours. There were 11 fatalities resulting from this dam breach flood. In 1977, the 45 foot high Laurel Run Earth Fill Dam located in Pennsylvania failed between 2.30 and 4 in the morning due to overtopping. It caused 40 fatalities. In 1977, the 35 foot high Kelly Barnes Earth Fill Dam failed about 3 in the morning from overtopping. There were no warnings and the dam breach flood caused 39 fatalities, all within a mile downstream of the dam. Recent studies have shown that the number of people endangered by a dam breach flood is related to the warning time that is available. For those dam breach floods with less than 15 minutes of warning time, 50% of the endangered population downstream could lose their lives due to a catastrophic dam breach flood. Whereas if more than 90 minutes of warning time is provided, the possible loss of life is reduced to less than 1% of the endangered downstream population. The warning time tends to be more available for very large dams where the likelihood is higher that someone would notice the pre-failure damages or actual breach formation. However, warning time is generally absent or much shorter for smaller dams, since small dams usually are not monitored prior to or during the breach formation. Also, small dams can be overtopped in much less time than a large dam that has significantly more flood storage capacity. To understand the characteristics of dam breach floods, we will study further the Teton Dam Breach Flood of 1976. The failure of Teton Dam began with a small piping failure observed about 10 in the morning. This slowly grew in size until it was quite significant by about 11.30 in the morning. It then began to grow more rapidly until a few minutes past noon when the eroded pipe breach opening caused the top of the dam to collapse. A trapezoidal shaped breach then formed very rapidly over the next 10 to 15 minutes. Prior to the collapse of the top of the dam into the pipe breach, the breach flow was controlled by pipe flow hydraulics. Very shortly thereafter, the photographs of the breach flow showed it had changed and was controlled by broad-crested weir flow hydraulics. As previously mentioned, the dam was 305 feet high with the water level 262 feet above the bed of the Teton River. The warning time for the dam breach flood was one to two hours and the flood caused 11 fatalities. The reservoir had about 250,000 acre feet of water stored above the bottom of the dam. The hydraulic head or depth of water above the bottom of the dam when the peak flow occurred was about 190 feet. The final average width of the trapezoidal shaped breach was 350 feet. Perhaps the breach would have been even wider if it had begun more in the middle of the dam rather than near the left side abutment of the dam as viewed from the downstream of the dam. The time for significant breach formation was estimated to be a little over one hour from about 11.30 a.m. to 12.40 p.m. This period began with the appearance of significant flow and ended when the peak flow occurred. Many days after the Teton Dam breach flood occurred, the peak flow was estimated to be about 2.3 million cubic feet per second. Some years later, the Teton Dam breach was simulated using the NWS models. Results from both the breach and dam break models indicate that the peak discharge was probably about 2 million cubic feet per second. The breach model produced the dam breach outflow hydrograph shown here. The time to peak is 1.1 hour and the peak flow is about 2 million cubic feet per second. The recession time for most of the breach outflow hydrograph is only about four hours. In this graphic, modeling results along with some observed peak flows obtained from indirect discharge measurements show the significant attenuation of the peak dam breach flow as it traveled through 60 miles of downstream river valley. The flood peak attenuated about 90 percent during its progression through the first 22 miles downstream of the dam. It decreased from 2 million cubic feet per second at the dam to approximately a quarter of a million cubic feet per second at mile 22. Then a small gradual decrease occurred 
from mile 22 to mile 60. Downstream of mile 22, only a small decrease in the peak flow occurred because the shape of the flood wave had become much more stable by the time the peak reached mile 22. Much of the attenuation in the first 22 miles was due to the lateral spreading of the flow to an inundation width of about nine miles as shown in this graphic. This occurred as the flood progressed beyond the narrow canyon where it spread out into a very wide and flat floodplain, where it flooded the towns of Guilford, Sugar City, and a portion of Rexburg. In this graphic, the width of the inundation reduced markedly as the Teton River discharged into the Snake River. This reduction in flooded width was due to, one, the large attenuation of the peak flow that had already occurred, and two, the effect of the confining walls of the Snake River cross sections. The simulated peak flows agree with the few indirect flow measurements made after the flood at miles 8.5, 43, and 60. The extremely attenuated peak flow of the Dam Breach flood equaled the Snake River flood of record at mile 43. Another aspect of the Teton Dam Breach flood was the travel time required for the peak flow to progress through the downstream river valley. In this graphic, the travel time T sub T of the peak flow is plotted against the miles downstream of the dam. As the dam breach flood traveled downstream through the first five miles of the narrow 1,200 foot wide canyon, the peak of the flood was estimated to travel about 16 miles per hour. However, due to the spreading of the flow into the wide valley downstream of the narrow canyon and the consequent lessening of the depth of flooding, the average travel speed of the flood peak through a 60 mile reach of the river valley below the dam was greatly reduced. This is evident in the plot of the travel time. At about mile 20, the travel time was about 10 hours. At mile 40, it was 20 hours. And at mile 60, it was 34 hours. From this, it's evident that the travel speed of the peak flow was only about two miles per hour. It is also noted in the plot that the simulated travel times agree with the few observations that were made during the flood. To further understand the characteristics of a dam breach flood, we will examine another actual dam breach flood, the Buffalo Creek flood of 1972. The Buffalo Creek coal waste dam breach flood was also simulated using the NWS dam breach models long after it occurred. The breach of the coal waste dam occurred from overtopping due to inadequate spillway capacity. There was less than five minutes of warning time and the flood caused 125 fatalities. Damages of over $50 million occurred along the downstream flooded area, which extended 16 miles downstream of the dam. The average river valley width was about 400 feet. The dam was 44 feet high and the initial water level was at the top of the dam. The volume of the reservoir was quite small, only 400 acre feet. The depth of water, H sub W, above the breach bottom when the peak flow occurred was about 21 feet. Therefore, a 23 foot drop in water level occurred as the breach formed in less than about five minutes. The average breach width was about 290 feet. The peak flow was simulated by the dam break and flood wave models to be just over 80,000 cubic feet per second. Notice the horizontal time axis is scaled such that each increment of time is only 0.05 hours. Plotting this hydrograph on the same time scale of the Teton hydrograph, the Buffalo Creek hydrograph appears as only a little spike. This contrast in flood magnitude shows how important the available warning time and the characteristics of the downstream river valley are in producing the death and destruction from a dam breach flood. At seven miles downstream, the simulated peak flow has rapidly attenuated to about 13,000 cubic feet per second, as shown in this plot of peak flow versus distance downstream of the dam. This compares favorably to the 12,000 cubic feet per second from indirect flow measurements made after the flood, also shown in the plot by the X symbol. The flow further attenuates to about 7,500 cubic feet per second at mile 16. The plot of the peak flow against miles downstream of the dam indicates a decreasing exponential attenuation. Thus, most of the peak has attenuated by mile 6, and thereon a small gradual attenuation occurs through mile 16. 
The simulated peak flows indicated by the X symbol agree with the indirect flow measurements taken after the flood. Here a plot of the flood peak travel time versus the distance from the dam is shown. It is evident that the travel time for the Buffalo Creek Dam Breach Flood is rather linear with downstream distance. Thus at mile 6 the travel time is 1 hour and at mile 12 it is 2 hours and at mile 16 it is a little less than 3 hours. From this it is apparent that the peak flow of the Dam Breach Flood traveled at an average speed of 6 miles per hour. Also, the simulated travel time agrees with the few available observations made during the flood. In summary, there are some simple rules for estimating dam breach flood characteristics. First, Q sub P, the peak flow in cubic feet per second, is estimated as 3 times the average breach width W sub B in feet times h sub w, which is raised to the power of 3 halves. h sub w is the water depth in feet above the breach bottom when the breach is fully formed. h sub w is estimated as the square of the quantity c divided by the quantity, the breach formation time t sub f, plus c divided by the square root of h. c is equal to 23.4 times s sub a, the surface area of the reservoir in acre feet, divided by the average breach width, W sub B. This approach is based on hydraulic principles of broad-crested weir flow and conservation of mass. An empirical statistical correlation approach can also be used for estimating the peak dam breach flow, Q sub P. The statistical predictor for Q sub P, the peak flow in cubic feet per second, is equal to 39.6 times the volume of the reservoir, V sub R, in acre feet above the breach bottom raised to the 0 0.3 power times the initial depth of water H above the breach bottom raised to the 1.25 power. The peak depth immediately downstream of a breach dam can be approximated if 1. The dam is assumed to breach completely and instantaneously and 2. Any friction effects and backwater effects in the downstream river valley are neglected. In this case the maximum depth is roughly equal to one-half of the initial depth of water, H, behind the dam. This approximation is often too large by 50 to 100 percent. Also, the depth reduces at points further downstream because of the attenuation of the peak flow. The dam breach peak flow travel speed can be roughly approximated by the expression 2 times the square root of the downstream river bottom slope, S sub M, measured in feet per mile. S sub M is the slope is equal to the fall of the river bottom measured in feet divided by the length measured in miles over which the fall is measured and the peak flow speed is estimated. The attenuation of the dam breach peak flow as it travels through the downstream river valley is characterized by an exponential type relationship for rather flat rivers with wide valleys. When the rivers are steeper or the valley is narrow, the attenuation is significantly less and its relationship with distance from the dam is more linear. The simple approximations that quantify the dam breach peak flow using the hydraulic or statistical approaches that have been presented are quite useful. However, the simple approximations for peak depth and travel speed are at best a very rough quantification of these dam breach flood properties, while the very important characteristics of peak flow attenuation and hydrograph dispersion are at best only descriptive. The dam breach flood depths, travel speed, and downstream attenuation characteristics of a dam breach flood are unique for each reservoir, each dam breach, and each downstream river valley. It is necessary to use spatial dam breach flood modeling techniques to give responsible and best available information about the properties of a particular dam breach flood for emergency action plans and flood warnings, as well as dam safety and dam design decision making. Since the dramatic attenuation associated with dam breach floods is much greater than the attenuation properties of rainfall snowmelt runoff generated floods, it's very important to use the spatial dam breach flood modeling techniques rather than the general models for typical rainfall snowmelt generated floods. I will now discuss the spatial dam breach flood modeling techniques embodied in the NWS suite of dam breach models, dam break, flood wave, simple dam break, and breach.
Several models have been developed to aid in the prediction of dam breach flood flows, depths, and their times of occurrence. Some aspects of dam breach modeling will be presented. The basis of this presentation is the modeling techniques incorporated in the NWS computer models, dam break, flood wave, simple dam break, and breach. After experiencing difficulties in issuing public flood warnings during the failure of the Teton Dam in 1976, the NWS recognized the need to develop a special technical capability to forecast possible future dam breach floods. The dam break model simulates the time-dependent formation of a breach in an earth fill, rock fill, or concrete dam. From this, it computes the time history of the dam breach outflow and develops the hydrograph of the dam breach outflow combined with the dam spillway and overtopping flows. The model also computes the changing reservoir depth as a consequence of a specified reservoir inflow hydrograph as well as the total outflow from the reservoir. The model then routes the total outflow hydrograph downstream and provides a time series of flow, depth, and velocity of the dam breach flood at numerous locations along the downstream river valley. The predicted flood information is based on the solution of the complete Sanvenet one-dimensional equations of unsteady flow. Backwater effects on the dam breach flood caused by downstream bridges or dams are incorporated in the predicted flood information. Other downstream effects such as levee overtopping, levee breaching, flow losses, and tidal effects are incorporated as necessary. The model output consists of hydrographs of flow and flood elevation at selected downstream locations. During the late 80s and early 90s, the flood wave model was developed to provide a general improvement in the overall NWS river forecasting capabilities. This model is similar to the dam break model, but includes enhancements that expand its capability to handle more complex river systems. Flood wave computes the flow properties throughout a system of interconnecting rivers and tributaries. The dam break model can predict the dam breach flood properties at various locations along a single river downstream from the breached dam. In comparison, the flood wave model can predict any dam breach flood properties throughout a system of rivers. This can include predictions in which the flood travels upstream on some of the tributaries or around significant islands. Flood properties can be predicted along distributaries flowing into a receiving body of water such as a lake or ocean. The flood wave model can account for the influence of a complicated levee system as illustrated in this graphic. The dam break model can predict the effects of only a single levee located on one side of the downstream river valley. Whereas the flood wave model can predict the effects caused by levees on both sides of the downstream rivers and tributaries, the levees can be discontinuous or they can loop to form storage areas anywhere along the downstream river system. Flood wave provides improved computational reliability for predicting flood properties in steep to mild sloping rivers which can have transcritical flow, which is a combination of subcritical and supercritical flows. Flood wave has essentially unlimited capacity for allowing very small computational distance steps to be used, which avoids many computational problems that the dam break model is unable to resolve. Also, it can compute the flow properties of mud floods and mud flows. Finally, the flood wave model has an easier and more flexible method of providing input data, and the model has an improved tabular and graphical information output as compared to the dam break model. The simple dam break model was formulated in the early 80s to provide a dam breach flood prediction model that could be executed on a simple handheld calculator as well as desktop computers. The simple dam break model computes the peak dam breach flow at the dam site. It also computes the peak flow, peak depth, and time of arrival of the peak at selected locations downstream of the dam. It does not account for the effects of backwater from downstream bridges or dams or other effects due to tributaries, levees, tides, or flow losses. However, it is a much simpler model than either the dam break or flood wave models. This enables it to have simple data input requirements and excellent computational reliability. In general, the simple dam break, when applied within its limitations, produces dam breach flood properties that generally differ by less than 10 percent from those produced by the more exact and complex dam break and flood wave models. The breach model was developed in the early 80s to forecast the potential outbreak of the Spirit Lake blockage formed by the Mount St. Helens eruption. The size and composition of the blockage varied considerably from a man-made dam. Thus, 
basic erosion mechanics rather than empirical breach parameters were chosen as the best approach to predict the formation of the breach. Accordingly, the breach model simulates the breach formation by erosion due to the overtopping or piping of a naturally formed landslide dam or an earth fill man-made dam. It computes the time history of the combined dam breach outflow along with the spillway and the overtopping flows. The model computes the time history of the width, depth, and shape of the breach. It also computes the changing reservoir depth due to the breach and spillway outflows, as well as any flows coming into the reservoir. The breach model does not compute flow properties of the dam breach flood along the downstream river valley. The information that comes from the model can be used as input for either the flood wave or dam break model in order to predict the dam breach flood properties at downstream locations. The breach model requires spatial information about the material properties of the dam, such as its cohesion, internal friction angle, and density, as well as detailed geometry of the earth fill dam, such as the slope of its upstream and downstream faces, and its crest width. The modeling techniques incorporated in the NWS models will be covered in the following general sequence. First, two methods for simulating the time history of the breach formation, an empirical parameter method, and an erosion mechanic method will be presented along with the associated dam breach outflow. Next, the modeling of the dam breach flood properties at locations downstream of the dam using a special flood routing method will be presented. This modeling or flood routing will incorporate the possible effects of downstream dams, bridges, and levees. Also, the capabilities to simulate river systems, including tributaries, will be presented. A third part will discuss how to avoid modeling difficulties that can be encountered when using the flood wave and dam break models. These difficulties usually arise from improper selection of computational distance steps along the rivers, the occurrence of transcritical flows at various locations along the river system, and the presence of floodplains, bridges, and levees. Next, some modeling components that contain inherent uncertainties in the prediction of dam breach flood properties will be presented and evaluated. Finally, some future improvements in dam breach flood modeling will be suggested and a summary will conclude the presentation. The breach is the opening formed in the dam through which the stored water escapes. The breach may be simulated by allowing it to develop over a finite interval of time defined as the breach formation time T sub F. It has a final or terminal bottom width denoted as B sub M. The shape of the breach is determined by the value of B sub M and a specified parameter Z, which is the horizontal component of the breach side slope ratio. These input parameters are denoted in this graphic illustrating the breach formation in a dam. The dam can be earth fill, concrete, or rock fill. Either an overtopping or a piping initiated breach can be simulated. The empirical parametric approach for simulating a dam breach is used in both the dam break and the flood wave models for reasons of simplicity, generality, and wide applicability to all types of dams. Also, it is practical due to the uncertainty in the actual breach formation mechanism, particularly for concrete dams. The slope parameter Z identifies the breach side slope, that is, the vertical to horizontal ratio 1 to Z. The range of Z values is from 0 to somewhat larger than 1. For earth fill and rock fill dams, its value depends on the internal friction angle of the wetted compacted materials through which the breach develops. Rectangular, triangular, or trapezoidal shapes may be specified by using various combinations of the values for Z and B sub M. For example, if Z equals 0 and B sub M is greater than 0, this produces a rectangular shaped breach. And if Z is greater than 0 and B sub M equals 0, this yields a triangular shaped breach. A trapezoidal shaped breach is produced when both Z and B sub M are greater than 0. The breach's terminal bottom width, B sub M, is related to the average breach width, W sub B, by the relation B sub M equals W sub B minus Z times H sub D, in which H sub D is the height of the dam. The average breach width W sub B, as discussed previously, 
is obtained from historical dam breach data. Also, the breach formation time T sub F is obtained in a similar manner. Statistical predictors for W sub B and T sub F were previously presented. Thus, the average breach width W sub B equals 9.5 times K sub 0 times the quantity V sub R times H sub D, that quantity raised to the power of 1 fourth. The breach formation time T sub F equals 0 0.3 times V sub R raised to the 0 0.53 power, and this is divided by H sub D raised to the 0 0.9 power. V sub R is the reservoir volume in units of acre feet, H sub D is the dam height, and K sub 0 is 1 for an overtopping failure and 0 0.7 for a piping failure. In simulating the breach, it is assumed that the breach bottom width B starts at a point and enlarges at a linear or nonlinear rate over the breach formation time T sub F until the terminal bottom width B sub M is attained. This occurs when the breach bottom has eroded to a specified terminal height H sub BM above the bottom of the dam. If T sub F is less than 0 0.02 hours, the bottom width B of the breach bottom starts at a value of B sub M rather than zero. This can be used to represent a rapid collapse failure, such as for a thin arch concrete dam or the earthquake generated liquefaction of an earth fill dam. The instantaneous bottom height of the breach H sub B is simulated as a function of time as illustrated in this graphic, in which H sub BM is the final height of the breach bottom. This is usually specified to be zero, which corresponds to the bottom of the reservoir or outlet channel bottom. The instantaneous breach bottom width B is shown as increasing in its width as the breach bottom lowers. The instantaneous breach bottom width is given by the expression B equals B sub M times the quantity T sub B divided by T sub F where the quantity is raised to the power of E. T sub B is the time since beginning of breach formation and E is the power specifying the degree of nonlinearity in the breach formation. For example, if E is 1, the formation rate is linear with time, while if E equals 2, the formation is a nonlinear quadratic rate. Although the range for E is usually from 1 to 3, a linear rate is usually assumed. B sub M, the terminal bottom width of the breach, is computed from the average breach width W sub B according to the following. B sub M equals W sub B minus Z times H sub D. The instantaneous height of the breach bottom, H sub B, is given by the relation H sub B equals H sub D minus the quantity H sub D minus H sub B M times the quantity T sub B divided by T sub F. The last quantity is raised to the power of E. As defined previously, H sub D is the dam height and H sub BM is the specified terminal height of the breach bottom. During the simulation of an overtopping initiated breach, the actual formation commences when the reservoir water height H exceeds the specified height H sub F. This feature permits the simulation of an overtopping of a dam where the breach does not begin to form until a specified amount of water is flowing over the crest of the dam and the downstream face of the dam has sufficient time to erode. Another way to initiate either an overtopping or piping form breach is simply to specify the time interval in hours after beginning of simulation until the breach begins to form. A piping form breach can be simulated whenever the initial centerline elevation of the pipe breach is specified as input to the model. The breach outflow, which changes with time, is computed by the following expression for broad-crested weir flow for a rectangular, triangular, or trapezoidal shaped breach. Q sub B equals K sub S times the rectangular shape broad-crested weir flow Q sub R plus K sub S times the V-shaped broad-crested weir flow Q sub V. Q sub R equals 3.1 times B sub I times the quantity H sub I minus H sub B, that quantity raised to the power of three halves. In this equation, B sub I is the instantaneous breach bottom width, H sub I is the instantaneous reservoir water surface elevation, and H sub B is the instantaneous breach elevation. 
The V-shaped broad-crested weir flow, Q sub V, equals 2.45 times Z times the quantity H sub I minus H sub B, that quantity raised to the power of 5 halves. In this equation, Z is the side slope of the breach. The factor K sub S is the submergence correction factor due to the downstream tailwater elevation H sub T. The factor K sub S equals 1 if H star is less than or equal to 0 0.67. However, if H star is greater than 0 0.67, K sub S equals 1 minus 27.8 times the quantity H star minus 0 0.67, that quantity raised to the power of 3. The variable H star is defined as the quantity H sub T minus H sub B divided by the quantity H sub I minus H sub B. If the breach is formed by piping, the breach outflow Q sub B is computed by an orifice flow equation. Thus, Q sub B equals C sub P times A sub P times the quantity H sub I minus H hat. That quantity raised to the power of one half. H hat equals H sub P. However, if H sub T is greater than H sub P, then H hat equals H sub T. A sub P is the cross-sectional area of the pipe breach. It is given by the expression A sub P equals 2 times B sub I times the quantity H sub P minus H sub B. The term H sub P is the specified centerline elevation of the pipe breach. Also, the breach outflow hydrograph simply can be computed as a triangular shaped hydrograph defined by the parameters Q sub 0, Q sub P, T sub P, and T sub R. The parameter Q sub 0 is an initial flow that can be simply estimated as the sum of the spillway and overtopping flows occurring prior to the start of the breach formation. Q sub P is computed by using the following empirical statistical predictor discussed earlier. Q sub P equals 39.6 times V sub R raised to the 0 0.3 power times H raised to the 1.25 power in which V sub R is the reservoir volume in acre feet and H is the initial reservoir depth in feet above the breach bottom. T sub P, the time to peak of the breach outflow hydrograph, is computed by using the statistical predictor for the breach formation time T sub F. The time of recession, T sub R, of the hydrograph is then obtained by using the following relation. T sub R equals 24.2 times V sub R divided by Q sub P minus T sub F. This simple triangular shaped breach outflow hydrograph can be input to either the flood wave or dam break model to determine the breach flood properties as it travels through the downstream river valley. Another means of determining the breach properties, as well as the dam breach flow hydrograph, is to use a physical based breach erosion model called breach. This model utilizes the principles of sediment transport, soil mechanics, and hydraulics. It predicts the breach characteristics such as its size, shape, and time of formation. And it predicts the discharge hydrograph emanating from a breached earth fill dam that is either man-made or naturally formed by a landslide. The model couples the conservation of mass of the reservoir inflow, the spillway outflow, and the breach outflow with the sediment transport capacity computed along an erosion-formed breach channel. This illustrates the conceptual growth of the breach channel. The bottom slope of the breach channel is assumed to be the downstream face of the dam and is given by the ratio 1 over Z sub D. The breach channel bottom erodes during successive delta T time steps, with the channel bottom always remaining parallel to the downstream face of the dam. When the breach channel bottom reaches the line denoted as BB, the breach channel begins to erode the upstream face of the dam. This enables additional water to enter the breach, which accelerates the rate of erosion and the growth of the breach. The incremental thickness delta D eroded all along the breach channel during each delta T time step is given by delta D equals Q sub S times delta T divided by the quantity P times L times the quantity 1 minus little p. In this equation, L is the length of the breach channel through the dam. 
P is its perimeter, and little p is the porosity of the breached material. The sediment transport capacity, Q sub s, of the breach flow along the breach channel is given by the equation Q sub s equals 3.64 times the ratio d sub 90 divided by d sub 30 raised to the 0.2 power times the ratio d raised to the power of 2 thirds divided by n times p times s raised to the 1.1 power times the quantity d times s minus 0.0054 times d sub 50 times tall sub c. In this equation, d sub 90, d sub 30, and d sub 50 are particle grain sizes in millimeters of the dam's materials. d is the breach channel hydraulic depth in feet, p is the perimeter of the breach channel in feet, and n is the Manning roughness coefficient. s is the slope of the downstream face of the channel in feet per feet, and tall sub C is the shield's critical shear stress that must be exceeded before erosion can occur. The breach formation is also dependent on the dam's material properties, such as the internal friction angle, phi, the cohesive strength, C, as well as the reservoir volume. The model considers the existence of the following complexities. One, the material pro properties of the core section of the dam, such as its average grain size, which differ from the properties of the outer portions of the dam. Two, the formation by overtopping water of an eroded channel along the downstream face of the dam prior to the actual breach formation. Three, the downstream face of the dam can have a grass cover or be composed of material such as riprap or cobblestones. Four, enlargement of the breach width by collapse of the breach size according to slope stability theory as illustrated here and five, initiation of the breach via piping with eventual collapse of the upper portions of the dam into the pipe and subsequent progression to a free surface broad crested weir flow. The total outflow hydrograph is obtained using computationally efficient and numerically stable time stepping iterative solution. The information produced by the breach model can be used as input to either the flood wave or dam break model to determine the dam breach flood properties along the downstream river valley. Either the breach outflow hydrograph values of flow and time or the breach parameters T sub F, W sub B, Z, H sub BM, and H sub F obtained from the breach model can be used as input for the flood wave or dam break model. The prediction of the extent and time of occurrence of flooding along the river valley downstream of a breach dam is called flood routing. Typical dam breach floods differ from most precipitation runoff floods because the dam breach floods have a much sharper peak and a shorter duration. Because of the rapidly varying temporal characteristics or unsteady flow of the dam breach flood, the shape of the dam breach flood is unstable. Therefore, its shape is greatly modified by attenuation and distortion as it propagates or flows through the downstream river valley. These modifications to the dam breach flood are accentuated by the effects of valley storage, riverbed and bank frictional resistance to flow, flow losses, and downstream channel constrictions and or flow control structures. Modifications to the dam breach flood are manifested as attenuation or reduction of the flood peak magnitude, spreading out or dispersion of the temporal varying flood volume and temporal and spatial variations in the celerity or propagation speed of the flood wave. If the downstream river valley contains significant storage volume, such as a wide floodplain, the flood peak can be extensively attenuated and in its propagation speed greatly reduced. Even when the downstream river valley cross sections approach the shape of a relatively narrow rectangular section, there is appreciable attenuation of the flood peak and reduction in the speed of its travel as the flood progresses through the river valley. There are two basic types of flood routing methods. These are called hydrologic and hydraulic routing. The hydrologic methods usually provide a more approximate analysis of the progression of a flood through a river than do the hydraulic methods. The hydrologic methods are used for reasons of convenience and economy. They are most appropriate as far as accuracy is concerned when the flood is not rapidly varying in time, 
that is, the flood's variations with time and space, are negligible compared to the effects of the forces of gravity and riverbed and bank friction that act upon the flood. Hydrologic methods are best used when the flood is very similar in shape and magnitude to previous floods for which depth and flow observations are available for essential calibration of the required empirical routing parameters. Of course, this is not the situation for a dam breach flood, which is unique for a particular river valley. Also, hydrologic methods do not account for unsteady backwater effects from downstream bridges or dams. In general, the best of the hydrologic methods the muskegon kunj diffusion routing method is not suitable for dam breach floods unless the riverbed slopes are fairly steep and there are no downstream bridges or dams to produce significant backwater. For routing errors to be less than 10 percent, the riverbed slope S sub m must exceed that given by the expression S sub m greater than 21.1 divided by T sub f raised to the 0.84 power. This is illustrated in this graphic. For example, if T sub f equals 0.5 hours, S sub m must be greater than 39 feet per mile, whereas if T sub f equals 0.25 hours, S sub m must be greater than 73 feet per mile for the routing errors to be less than 10 percent. Each of these computed slopes represent fairly steep rivers. When routing highly unsteady dam breach floods, a particular hydraulic routing method known as dynamic routing is most appropriate because it can be more accurate in simulating dam breach floods than the hydrologic methods, as well as other less complex hydraulic methods such as the kinematic and diffusion methods. Of the many available hydrologic and hydraulic routing techniques, only dynamic routing accounts for the effects of the large flow variations in time and space of the dam breach flood and the effects of downstream unsteady backwater produced by channel constrictions, dams, bridge road embankments, and tributary inflows. Dynamic routing consists of obtaining the solutions of the complete one-dimensional equations of unsteady flow. They consist of two partial differential equations known as the Sanvenant equations. The first equation conserves the mass of the unsteady flow as it travels along the downstream path or x direction of the river valley. The term partial of Q divided by the partial of X represents the change in flow along the river valley. It can be either plus or minus as illustrated in this graphic. The term partial of A plus A sub zero divided by the partial of T represents the change in active area A and off-channel storage area A sub zero with respect to a delta T change in time as illustrated in this graphic. That portion of the channel cross-section in which flow occurs is called the active area A. Off-channel storage areas A sub zero can be used effectively to account for an adjacent abatement, ravine, or tributary, which connect at some elevation with the flow channel but do not convey flow in the X direction along the river valley. Off-channel storage areas serve only to store some of the passing flow. River valley cross-sections are generally of irregular geometrical shape as illustrated in this graphic, each cross-section can be described by tabular values of channel top width and water surface elevation. Generally, about 4 to 12 sets of top widths and, and associated elevations provide a sufficiently accurate description of a cross-section. If topographical maps are used to obtain the cross-sections, the contour interval affects the number of top widths used to describe the cross-section. Area elevation tables can be automatically generated initially from the top width elevation data specified as input to a model. Within the model, the area below each top width is simply computed as indicated in the graphic. That is, A sub 1 equals 0, and A sub 2 is equal to A sub 1 plus the average of B sub 1 and B sub 2 top widths times the difference between H sub 2 and H sub 1. Also, by using this approach, areas or top widths associated with any particular water surface elevation can be linearly interpolated from the tabular values. Cross-sections are generally used at locations along the river where significant cross-sectional changes occur or at locations where major tributaries enter. It is essential that the selected cross-sections accurately represent the volume available to contain the flow along the river valley. The spacing of cross-sections along the river valley can range from a few hundred feet 
to a few miles, depending on the variability of the cross sections. Generally, the smaller the river, the smaller will be the required spacing of the sections to obtain an accurate simulation. The sinuosity term, S sub C, accounts for the fact that some of the flood flow can find a shorter downstream flow path by short-circuiting the river channel. When the flow exceeds the river's bank full capacity, some of the flow follows the shorter mean flow path along the river valley x-axis. The within bank flows continue following the longer meandering or sinuous river flow path. The sinuosity factor, which is always greater than or equal to one, is the ratio of the flow path distance along the meandering river to the mean flow path distance along the x-axis of the river valley. It is specified for each cross-sectional top width and therefore can be depth weighted. Thus, when short-circuiting of flow occurs, the total flow is still comprised of a quantity of flow within the bankful river channel, which follows the meandering river, as well as another portion of the total flow, which follows the valley flow path along the x-axis. As shown here, the term little q is the lateral flow per linear distance along the channel. The lateral flow can be inflow, in which case the sign of little q is positive. The lateral flow can be outflow, in which case the sign is negative. The second of the Sambanon equations conserves the momentum of the flow along the river valley. The first term, S sub m times the partial of q divided by the partial of t, represents the sinuosity coefficient times the change in the flow with respect to time. In this graphic, the term partial of q divided by the partial of t is illustrated by the finite difference approximation of the quantity q superscript t plus delta t minus q divided by delta t. The second term, the partial of q squared divided by a divided by partial of x represents the change in the product of velocity or q divided by a times the flow q along the x-axis of the river valley as illustrated in this graphic. Due to the narrow width of the river at cross section i plus 1, the velocity at that section will be higher. Also, the flow q changes along the river's x-axis as the flood travels through sections i, i plus 1, and i plus 2. These first two terms in the Sanfanon equations are the inertia terms. Finite difference approximations of these terms cause unwanted numerical instability in the solutions of the equations when the unsteady flow passes through critical flow. Critical flow occurs when the flow velocity q divided by a is equal to the propagation velocity of a small flow disturbance. The flow disturbance velocity is defined as the square root of the quantity g times a divided by b in which g is the gravity acceleration constant 32.2 feet per second squared. When the flow velocity is less than the flow disturbance velocity, the flow is subcritical. When the flow velocity is larger than the flow disturbance velocity, the flow is supercritical. When the unsteady flow changes either in space along the x-axis or in time from subcritical to supercritical or from supercritical to subcritical, the flow is defined as transcritical. A method for treating the numerical instabilities associated with transcritical flow will be discussed later. The term partial of h divided by the partial of x in the Sanvenant momentum equation represents the change in water surface elevation along the x-axis of the river valley. This term is shown in this graphic by denoting the difference between the water surface elevation at the location i plus 1 and the water surface elevation at i. The term partial of h divided by the partial of x is then obtained by dividing this difference by the distance delta x sub i over which the change occurs. The term s sub f is the boundary friction slope or the loss of potential energy expressed in feet per foot of distance along the x axis of the river valley. The total energy loss is illustrated in this graphic as the product of s sub f times the delta x reach length. The boundary friction slope is expressed as follows. s sub f equals the absolute value of q times q divided by k. The absolute value of q is used so that negative or reverse flows will produce the correct sign for s sub f. k is the flow conveyance. It is equal to 1.49 divided by n 
times A times the quantity A divided by B, that quantity raised to the power of two-thirds. The parameter N is the Manning coefficient of frictional resistance to flow. It is a basic component of the Manning equation for uniform flow. The Manning N parameterizes the resistance to flow in the river valley due to the effects of particle roughness of the alluvial sand and gravel particles composing the riverbed and banks, as well as the energy losses attributed to dynamic alluvial bed forms and vegetation of various types, such as trees, brush, field crops, and grass, located along the banks and overbanks, or floodplain. Also, river bend losses are included as components of the Manning Inn. The Manning Inn is defined for each delta x reach of river valley between cross sections, and it is specified for various magnitudes of flows or depths. The term S sub E represents energy losses due to large eddies in the flow. These occur where cross sections severely expand and to a lesser extent where they severely contract along the river valley. S sub E is equal to K divided by the quantity 2 times G times the difference in the quantity Q divided by A, that quantity squared. The term K is the specified expansion contraction coefficient which varies from 0 to 1. The term delta times the quantity Q divided by A, that quantity squared, is the difference in the square of the velocity Q divided by A at two adjacent cross sections separated by the delta X distance. The term S sub I is the additional friction slope associated with internal viscous dissipation of non-Newtonian fluids, fluids other than water such as mud flows. The term S sub I is used only when the fluid is non-Newtonian. It is evaluated as a function of the mud flow properties, such as its yield strength, viscosity, and unit weight, as well as the wetted cross-sectional properties of area on top width. Additional details on the viscous dissipation term, S sub I, can be found in the references for dam breach applications such as phosphate impoundments. The term L in the momentum equation is the momentum effect of lateral flow. This term takes on the following definition. If lateral flow is inflow, L equals minus little q times V sub x, where V sub x is the velocity of the lateral inflow in the x direction of the river. Since in the flood wave and dam break models, the lateral flow is always assumed to enter perpendicular to the river flow, V sub x is zero, except for tributary flow. If the lateral flow is seepage lateral outflow, L equals minus 0 0.5 times little q times q divided by A. And if the lateral flow is bulk lateral outflow, such as overtopping flow along a levee, L equals minus little q times q divided by A. The St. Venon equations are nonlinear partial differential equations which must be solved by numerical approximation techniques. In the dam break and flood wave computer models, an implicit four-point finite difference approximation technique is used to obtain the solution. This particular technique is selected for its computational efficiency, flexibility, and convenience in application to unsteady flow in river valleys. In essence, the technique determines the unknown quantities flow, Q, and water surface elevation, H, at all specified cross-sections along the downstream river valley at various times into the future. The solution is advanced from one time to a future time by a finite time interval or time step of magnitude delta t. In the weighted four-point implicit scheme, the continuous xt region, where solutions for h and q are wanted, is represented by a rectangular grid of discrete points. This is illustrated in this graphic of an xt plane. The grid points are determined by the intersection of lines drawn parallel to the x and t axes. Those parallel to the t axis represent locations of cross sections. They have a spacing of delta x which do not have to be the same between each pair of cross sections. Those parallel to the x axis represent timelines. They have a spacing of delta t which also do not have to be the same between timelines. Each point in the rectangular network of points can be identified by a subscript I which designates the x position or cross section and a superscript J that designates a particular timeline. 
The Sanvenant unsteady flow equations are expressed in finite difference form for all cross sections along the river valley as illustrated here for the conservation of mass equation. This finite difference equation shown here is applied only to one particular delta x sub i reach of the river valley. A weighting factor, theta, is used to position the finite difference approximation for the term partial of q divided by the partial of x and the term little q about midway between two lines, two timelines, j and j plus 1. Usually a value of theta between 0.55 and 0.65 is used to provide the best accuracy and numerical stability. This theta value is multiplied by the finite difference expression for the values of q and little q at the timeline j plus 1, while the quantity 1 minus theta is multiplied by the q and little q values at the j timeline. The time derivative, the partial of the quantity a plus a sub 0 divided by the partial of t, is approximated by subtracting an average of the quantity a plus a sub 0 at the i and i plus 1 cross sections at the j plus 1 timeline from a similar average of the quantity a plus a sub 0 at the j timeline. This difference is then divided by the delta t, the period of time over which the difference occurs. After expressing the conservation of momentum equation in a similar manner for each delta x sub i reach between all cross sections, all of the finite difference algebraic equations are then solved simultaneously for the unknowns q and h at each cross section. Due to the nonlinearity of the partial differential equations and their finite difference representations, the solution must be iterative. A highly efficient iterative technique known as the newton raphson method is used. Convergence of this iteration technique is attained when the difference between successive iterative solutions for each unknown is less than a relatively small prescribed tolerance, like one cubic foot per second and 0.01 foot. Usually, one to three iterations at each time step are sufficient for convergence to be attained for each unknown at all cross sections. A more complete description of the solution technique may be found in the references. Values for the unknowns at external boundaries or the upstream and downstream extremities of the total routing reach of the river valley must be specified in order to obtain solutions to the sum of non-equations. Sometimes the upstream boundary is simply a specified discharge time series or hydrograph of inflow at the most upstream cross section as illustrated here and noted as case one. The hydrograph may be obtained from the following. One, the breach outflow hydrograph from the breach model, or two, the breach outflow hydrograph using empirical statistical predictors for Q sub P and T sub F as previously described, or three, a predicted runoff hydrograph from a rainfall snowmelt runoff model, or four, historical observations, or a design reservoir inflow hydrograph. The upstream boundary is expressed as Q sub one equals QI. Q sub 1 is the flow at the upstream or first cross section, and QI is the specified inflow hydrograph or time series of QI values. Many times, as illustrated here, denoted as case 2, the most upstream cross section can represent both the inlet to an upstream reservoir and the upstream face of a dam. In this case, a simple routing procedure called reservoir level pool routing can be used rather than the considerably more complex dynamic routing to route the inflow through the upstream reservoir. This is appropriate if the reservoir is not excessively long and if the inflow hydrograph, QI, is not rapidly changing with time. In level pool routing, the reservoir is assumed to always have a horizontal or level water surface throughout its entire length. Because of this condition, the routing method is called level pool routing. The water surface elevation h changes with time t, and the outflow from the reservoir is assumed to be a function of h, which is also a function of time. This is the case for reservoirs with uncontrolled overflow spillways, such as the OG-crested, 
the broad-crested weir, and the morning glory types. Gate controlled spillways can be included in level pool routing if the height of the gate bottom above the gate sill is a predetermined function of time. Of course, reservoirs where the dam fails and produces a breach outflow hydrograph can be included in the level pool routing approach. However, if the breach formation time T sub F is less than about 0.2 hours, the level pool routing for the upstream reservoir is not recommended for best accuracy. In this situation, the breach dam should be treated as described in case one. The upstream boundary condition for this situation, referred to as case two, is represented by the expression illustrated here. Q sub one equals QI, which is a function of T, minus one half times 43,560 times S sub A times delta H divided by delta T, in which QI is the known inflow hydrograph to the reservoir S sub A is the reservoir surface area in acres at the water surface elevation H, and delta H is the change in reservoir water surface elevation during the delta T time step. In this approach, the first cross section is located immediately upstream of the dam, and the second cross section is located immediately downstream of the dam at the tailwater section. Two internal boundary equations that are described later are used to govern the flow through the dam between the first and second cross sections. A downstream boundary condition is usually required for flood routing. This can be either a specified flow or water surface elevation time series, or as illustrated here, a tabular relation between flow and water surface elevation like the rating curve. Another downstream boundary condition can be a computed loop rating curve or flow water elevation relationship based on the Manning equation. The loop is produced by using the friction slope S sub F rather than the river bottom slope, S sub M, in the Manning equation. The friction slope can be approximated as the quantity H sub N minus one minus H sub N divided by delta X, in which the water surface elevations are obtained from the previous time step. And N represents the last cross section, which is at the location of the downstream boundary. The friction slope exceeds the bottom slope during the rising limb of the hydrograph while the reverse is true for the recession limb. The loop rating boundary equation allows the simulated unsteady flow to pass the downstream boundary with minimal disturbance or error induced by the boundary itself. This downstream boundary is desirable when the routing is terminated at an arbitrary location along the river valley, not at a location of actual flow control such as a dam or waterfall, or where the flow is affected by downstream backwater conditions produced by tidal action reservoirs, or tributary inflow. The downstream boundary can, can also be a known water elevation time series, such as a tide or a large lake that has a relatively constant water level. The downstream boundary condition can also be a critical flow section, such as the entrance to a waterfall or a short steep river reach or rapids. Critical flow occurs when the bottom slope S sub M equals or exceeds the critical slope S sub C in feet per mile. It can be easily computed as follows. S sub C equals 77,000 times N squared divided by D raised to the power of one third, in which N is the Manning N and D is the hydraulic or average depth given by A divided by B. When the downstream boundary is a rating curve, the flow at the boundary should not be affected by flow conditions further downstream although there are often some minor effects due to the presence of cross-sectional irregularities downstream of the chosen boundary location, these can usually be neglected unless the irregularity is so pronounced as to cause significant backwater or drawdown effects. Reservoirs or major tributaries that are located below the downstream boundary, which cause backwater effects at the boundary, should be avoided. When either of these situations is unavoidable, the routing reach should be extended downstream to the dam, in the case of the reservoir, or to a location downstream of where a major tributary enters. Sometimes it may be possible to move the downstream boundary to a location further upstream where backwater effects are negligible. Any dam may be considered an internal boundary that is defined as a short delta x reach between sections I and I plus one, in which the flow is governed by the following two equations, 
rather than the two Sambanan equations. These equations are simply q sub i minus q sub i plus 1 equals 0, and q sub i equals q sub s plus q sub b, where q sub s and q sub b are the total spillway and breach flow, respectively. In fact, the flood wave and dam break models can simulate the progression of a dam breach flood through an unlimited number of reservoirs located sequentially along the river valley by treating each of the dams as an internal boundary condition using these simple equations. For each downstream reservoir, specified cross-sections are used to describe its available storage capacity. Also, any of the downstream dams may also breach if they are sufficiently overtopped. The total spillway flow, Q sub S, is made up of the sum of the uncontrolled spillway flow, Q sub SP, the gate control flow, Q sub G, the dam crest overtopping flow, Q sub zero, and the turbine flow, Q sub T. The total spillway flow, Q sub S, is time dependent because the reservoir water surface elevation, H, changes due to the reservoir inflow and breach and total spillway outflows. Additional details of the computation of the total spillway flow can be found in the references. Also, an internal boundary condition can be used to simulate the effects of any downstream bridge and its embankment on the progression of the dam breach flood through the river valley. In this case, the term Q sub S is the internal boundary equation given by Q sub S equals the sum of the contracted opening bridge flow, Q sub BR, the embankment overtopping flow, Q sub E, and the embankment breach flow, Q sub BE. The contracted opening bridge flow is given by Q sub BR equals 5.67 times C sub BR times A sub, sub I plus 1 times the square root of the quantity H sub I minus H sub I plus 1 where C sub BR is a bridge flow coefficient which can vary from about 0.6 to 1. A sub I plus 1 is the wetted cross-sectional area at the downstream end of the bridge opening. H sub I is the water surface elevation just upstream of the bridge. And H sub I plus 1 is the water surface elevation just downstream of the bridge. The embankment overflow, Q sub E, and breach flow, Q sub B E, are computed like those for a dam. As illustrated in this graphic, an internal boundary can be used to simulate a waterfall or a short, steep reach of rap rapids. The term Q sub S is equal to the square root of the quantity G times A sub I raised to the power of 3 divided by B sub I. Flows that overtop levees located along the downstream river valley and its tributaries can be treated as lateral flow in the Sanvanon equations. As shown in this graphic, the levees can be located on either or both sides of the river or any of its tributaries. The overtopping levee flow can be neglected as indicated in the graphic by A, or it can be contained within storage areas formed by the levees as indicated by B and C, or it can flow downstream and re-enter the river as indicated by D. The lateral flow, little q, diverted over the levee is computed as broad-crested weir flow. This overtopping flow is corrected for submergence effects if the floodplain water surface elevation H sub F sufficiently exceeds the levee crest elevation H sub C. After the flood peak passes, the overtopping flow may reverse its direction and return to the river when the floodplain water surface elevation H sub F exceeds the river water surface elevation. The overtopping broad crested weir flow is computed according to the following. Little q equals minus C sub E times K sub S times the quantity H minus H sub C raised to the power of 3 halves. In this equation, C sub E is an empirical broad crested weir flow coefficient and K sub S is the submergence correction factor, which is computed in a manner similar as dam breach flow, except H star equals the quantity H sub F minus H sub C, divided by the quantity H minus H sub C. 
Flow in the floodplain can affect overtopping flows via the submergence correction factor. As shown here, flow may also pass from the waterway to the floodplain through a time-dependent crevasse or breach in the levee via a breach flow equation similar to that for a breach dam. The breach flow can be significantly affected by the floodplain water service elevation H sub F through the submergence correction factor K sub S. The breach flow may even reverse its direction as illustrated here. The floodplain, which is separated from the river or tributary by the levee, may be treated as a dead storage area A sub zero in the Sanvanan equations, or the floodplain can be treated as another tributary which receives its inflow as lateral flow comprised from both the levee overtopping flow and the levee breach flow. This total flow is then dynamically routed along the floodplain using the Samanon equations. Finally, if the floodplain is divided into compartments by levees or dikes or elevated roadways located somewhat perpendicular to the river levee, the floodplain can be treated as a reservoir and its water surface elevation can be computed using a level pool routing method. When routing a flood through a system of interconnecting rivers, a special technique called the relaxation algorithm is used at each river junction where a river exchanges flow with a tributary. During a time step, the relaxation algorithm first solves the Sampanon equations for the receiving river and then solves them separately for each tributary river. Each tributary flow entering the receiving river is treated as lateral flow or little q. This lateral flow is first estimated from the previous time step using the computed tributary flow. Then the estimated lateral inflow is used in solving the Sanvanon equations that are applied to the receiving river. Each tributary flow depends on its upstream boundary condition and the water surface elevation at the junction, which is also the downstream boundary for the tributary. This water surface elevation is obtained during the application of the Sanvanon equations to each receiving river. Due to the interdependence of the flows in the receiving river and its tributary, the following iterative or relaxation algorithm is used. Little q star equals alpha times q sub t divided by delta x plus the quantity 1 minus alpha times q double star. In this algorithm, Q double star is the old estimate for the lateral inflow at the junction. Q sub t is the recently computed flow at the downstream end of the tributary. Q star is the new improved estimate of the lateral flow. And alpha is a weighting factor varying from about 0.5 to 1. Convergence is attained when Q star is sufficiently close to the quantity Q sub t divided by delta x. Usually one or two iterations are sufficient when the weighting factor has been optimized. The initial selection of alpha is difficult since it varies with each river system configuration. A good initial approximation for alpha is in the range of 0.6 to 0.8, and a better value is easily obtained after a few trial and error simulations. The acute angle, W sub t, that the tributary makes with the receiving river is a specified parameter. This enables the inclusion of the momentum effect of the tributary inflow via the term in the St. Menant Conservation of Momentum Equation minus little q times v sub x, where v sub x is the velocity of the tributary flow in the direction of the receiving river. The velocity of the tributary inflow is given by the quantity q sub t times the cosine of w sub t divided by a sub t, in which the subscript t denotes the last cross-section of the tributary. A very simple and easy to use flood routing technique for dam breach floods is available in the simple dam break model. This model is appropriate when quick results are needed and when the river valley downstream from a breach dam is uncomplicated by unsteady backwater effects from other dams or bridges or levee overtopping or the presence of large tributaries. The simple dam break model determines the peak flow, peak depth, and time of occurrence at selected locations downstream of a breach dam. The model first computes the peak outflow, Q sub P, at the dam based on the reservoir size and the temporal and geometrical description of the breach. The following equation is used. 
Q sub P equals 3.1 times W sub B times the quantity C divided by T sub F plus C divided by the square root of H sub D. This entire quantity is raised to the power of 3. C is defined as 23.4 times S sub A divided by W sub B, in which S sub A is the reservoir surface area in acres, and W sub B, T sub F, and H sub D are the average breach width, breach formation time, and height of dam, respectively. The computed peak flow and downstream river valley cross-section properties are used along with spatial dimensionless routing curves to determine the extent that the peak flow will be attenuated or reduced as it travels downstream. The dimensionless routing curves were developed from data obtained from numerous executions of the dam break model. The curves are grouped into families based on the fruit number associated with the dam breach flood peak. They have as their abscissa the ratio of the downstream distance that is measured from the dam to a selected cross section where Q sub P and other properties of the flood wave are desired, divided by a distance parameter X sub C. The parameter X sub C is the function of the reservoir volume and the volume in the downstream river valley at a depth equivalent to the dam height. The ordinate of the curves is the ratio of the peak flow Q sub PX at the selected cross section to the computed peak flow Q sub P at the dam. The distinguishing characteristic of each member of the family of curves is the volume ratio V sub zero. This is the ratio of the reservoir volume to the average flow volume in the downstream river valley from the dam to the selected cross section where the flood properties are wanted. Additional details on the computation of the dimensionless parameters can be found in the references. The simple dam break model then computes the depth produced by the peak flow using the Manning equation applied to a particular location along the river valley, having cross-sectional properties of area A and top width B, riverbed slope S in units of feet per feet, and Manning N. The simple dam break model also determines the time required for the peak to reach each location by computing the peak flow travel speed. The simple dam break model neglects backwater effects created by any downstream dams or bridge embankments the presence of which may substantially reduce the model's accuracy. However, its ease of use makes it an attractive tool for cases where limited time and resources preclude the use of the dam break or flood wave model and where backwater effects are judged insignificant. The simple dam break model was compared with the dam break model for numerous theoretical applications and for six hypothetical dam breach floods, where the effects of backwater from downstream dams and bridges levee overtopping or significant downstream tributaries were negligible. The average difference between the two models was less than 10% for predicted peak flows and travel times and peak depths. This error was not sensitive to the breach formation time T sub F or the river bottom slope S sub M as was the muskegon coons diffusion routing method previously discussed. In using the dam break and flood wave models, there can be situations where the models fail to complete the computations because of encountering severe numerical instabilities. It has been found that these can be avoided by judicious selection of certain input parameters and modeling options. The most common difficulty is that of using too large a delta x sub i distance step in the dynamic routing computations. This produces solution errors in the finite difference equations used to approximate the Sambanon equations. The numerical parameters of delta x and delta t control the extent of the error as conceptually shown in this graphic. The minimal errors correspond to the selection of the delta x and delta t values such that the delta x to delta t ratio closely approximates the actual travel speed of the flood peak C sub p. If the delta x value selected is too large, the errors increase. If the errors increase beyond a certain undefined limit denoted as E sub C, the computations become so unstable that they fail. If the selected delta X is too small, the errors increase somewhat, but this is usually not enough to cause serious instability and failure of the computations. Therefore, it is critical for achieving successful computations that the selected delta X sub I values are sufficiently small according to the following criterion delta x sub i 
less than C sub P times delta T, in which delta T with units of hours is the time step used in the computations, and C sub P with units of miles per hour is the peak flow travel speed. Delta T equals T sub F divided by M, where T sub F is the breach formation time and the parameter M can vary from 10 to 40 with the larger value providing greater numerical stability while requiring that smaller delta X sub I be selected. C sub P can be roughly approximated as two times the square root of S sub M, where S sub M is the river bottom slope in feet per mile. Since the slope can vary along the total reach of river being modeled, the selection of delta X sub I will also vary along the river. Since C sub P is just approximated by the expression 2 times the square root of S sub M, some trial and error is often required to select the appropriate delta X sub I for a successful completion of the model computations. After obtaining a successful computation, a more accurate C sub P can be obtained from the model output. This is accomplished by using the computed times at which the flood peak arrived at locations along the river valley, together with the expression C sub P equals L divided by the quantity T sub P K plus 1 minus T sub P K, where L is the distance between the two locations K and K plus 1, and the T sub P values represent the times at which the flood peak arrives at these two locations. Additionally, delta X sub I must be selected small enough to satisfy another numerical stability constraint shown here. This arises from severe expansion or contraction changes in the cross sections along the river valley. In the case of an expansion change in cross section, delta X sub I must be less than or equal to L divided by M sub E, where M sub E equals 0 0.99 plus 1.74 times the quantity A sub I plus 1 minus A sub I divided by A sub I. In the case of a contracting reach of river, as illustrated in this graphic, delta X sub I must be less than or equal to L divided by M sub E, where M sub E equals 0 0.99 plus 1.74 times the quantity A sub I minus A sub I plus 1 divided by A sub I plus 1. The dam break and flood wave model automatically determine the delta X sub I required by the expansion contraction stability constraints. If these constraints are found to produce a smaller delta X sub I than that required by the delta X to delta T ratio, the smaller delta X sub I must be selected for use in the model. Most versions of the dam break model have limited storage capacity, which may not allow the use of the required minimum delta X sub I values. However, the flood wave model does have sufficient storage to accommodate the delta X sub I requirements. Another common cause for the routing computations to fail is the occurrence of transcritical flow, which is supercritical flow changing to subcritical flow and passing through critical flow. The finite difference approximations for the Santmanon equations are numerically unstable for critical flow. The occurrence of transcritical flow can vary with either time or distance along the routing reach. The occurrence of transcritical flow is highly dependent upon the river valley bed slope S sub M, a critical bed slope S sub C expressed in units of feet per mile is defined as S sub C equals 77,000 times N squared divided by the quantity A divided by B raised to the power of one-third, where N is the Manning N. If any values of the actual river slope S sub M are both less than or greater than S sub C, transcritical flow can occur. The transcritical flow requires spatial treatment to provide reliable solutions of the Sanvanon equations. This is accomplished by using a local partial inertia filter, sigma, which multiplies the first two inertia terms in the conservation of momentum equation. This filter is applied to each delta X sub I reach of the river at each delta T time step. The expression for the sigma filter is one minus the quantity FR divided by FR sub C, the quantity raised to the power of M. FR is the fruit number of the flow in each delta X sub I reach. 
it is computed as FR equals Q divided by A divided by the square root of the quantity G times A divided by B. The exponent M varies from 1 to 5, with 2 or 3 usually preferred. The sigma filter takes on a value of 0 when FR is greater than or equal to FR sub C. FR sub C is a specified parameter that can vary from 0.8 to 0.95. Judicious use of the sigma filter avoids numerical difficulties associated with transcritical flow while introducing negligible errors. The errors are less than a maximum of 2% for all possible flows and less than 1% for almost all flow conditions usually encountered in dam breach flood routing. This is accomplished by maximizing the sigma filter as illustrated in this graphic. By using an exponent m of 3 or 5, sigma is in the vicinity of 1 except for FR values approaching the value of FR sub c. Numerical stability and solution errors increase as M and FR sub C decrease within their acceptable range. Sometimes another numerical difficulty is encountered when the rising flood overtops an embankment associated with a downstream bridge, dam, or levee, as illustrated in this graphic. When an embankment is overtopped, additional flow due to overtopping broadcrested wear flow suddenly occurs. The broadcrested wear flow equation, Q, equals C sub B times L sub E times the quantity H sub I minus H sub E, the quantity raised to the power of three halves. In this equation, C sub B is the empirical coefficient of flow, which varies from 2.6 to 3.1. H sub I is the water surface elevation. H sub E is the elevation of the top of the embankment. And L sub E is the length of the embankment. Such a sudden and large change in flow can cause numerical instability. The magnitude of the sudden change in flow is controlled by the length of the embankment and the size of the time step, delta t. If a smaller time step is selected, the increase in surface water elevation above the crest of the embankment is made smaller. This can reduce the flow over the embankment and thereby reduce the sudden increase in the total flow, thus eliminating the numerical instability. There are options that can be selected within the flood wave model to allow a smaller size of time step to be used just prior to the overtopping of a particular embankment. When a river valley cross section has a very wide and flat floodplain, numerical instability can sometimes occur when the water elevation first goes out of bank into the floodplain or when the water surface elevation recedes from the floodplain back into the river channel. This numerical instability arises when the floodplain side slope, Z sub F, or the change in total floodplain width per foot of increase in elevation, is greater than about 150 feet per foot. When the floodplain side slope, or 1 divided by Z sub F, exceeds this ratio, a special floodplain option must be selected. This option requires the separate input of cross-sectional top widths and manning in values for the channel, the left floodplain, and the right floodplain, as illustrated here. This requires the separation of the usually specified composite total top widths and in values into their component parts. The model then computes the total conveyance as the sum of the separate conveyances for the channel, K sub C, left floodplain, K sub LF, and right floodplain, K sub RF. Another situation can cause transcritical flow difficulties. This occurs when the inbound portions of the river cross sections are specified with so much detail that very small scale riffles and pools and other small irregularities in the river bottom slope serve to control very low flows. At low flows, these can produce transcritical flows. This is eliminated by smoothing the river bottom slope by slightly changing the elevations of the top width values near the bottom of the cross sections. Another way to eliminate this transcritical flow problem is to simply increase the initial flow so that the slope irregularities that produce the transcritical flow are drowned out. Usually an initial flow at time equals zero that exceeds about one-third bank full flow is sufficient to drown out the occurrence of the localized transcritical flows. Such a relative small increase in initial flow conditions compared to the peak flow will usually have negligible effect on the simulated dam breach flood properties.
The greatest uncertainty in the model or predicted flood peak elevations and arrival times is caused by uncertainty in the selection of the breach parameters, especially W sub B and T sub F. The best approach to quantify this uncertainty is to perform a sensitivity test using minimum and maximum reasonable values for W sub B and T sub F. The maximum dam breach flood is produced by selecting the maximum W sub B and minimum T sub F whereas the minimum flood is produced by using the minimum W sub B and the maximum T sub F values. The differences in flood peak properties, that is, the flow, elevation, and time of arrival at any section downstream of the dam, due to variations in the breach parameters, reduce in magnitude or is damped as the dam breach flood propagates through the downstream river valley. This damping effect is maximum when the downstream river valley is a wide floodplain. The wider, the greater the damping effect. This is minimized when the downstream river valley is narrow and rectangular shaped. The downstream peak flows are greater for the rectangular cross sections as compared to the peak flow curves for the downstream river valley with a wide floodplain. For example, the delta Q sub P at mile 25 for the narrow rectangular canyon is about three times larger than the delta Q sub P for the wide floodplain. The estimation of the Manning Inn can also be subject to considerable uncertainty due to its complexity. The Manning Inn varies with the magnitude of the flow. As the flow increases and more portions of the bank and can overbank or floodplain become inundated, the vegetation, especially trees, located at these elevations cause an increase in the resistance to flow. The Manning Inn also tends to decrease with increasing discharge when the increase in the overbank flow area is relatively small compared to the increase of the flow area within the banks. This is the case with wide rivers that have levees located near the river banks. Guidance for selecting the Manning Inn may be found in the references. A useful predictor for the Manning Inn for in-bank flows of rivers that have relatively steep bottom slopes, S sub M, greater than 11 feet per mile, and have gravel, cobble, boulder beds is N equals 0 0.015 times S sub M raised to the 0 0.34 power and then divided by the quantity A divided by B raised to the 1 6th power. Manning N values for flows less than bank full in flat to mile sloping rivers bottom slopes are approximately 0 0.015 to 0 0.035 for large rivers like the Mississippi and the Ohio rivers. 0 0.03 to 0 0.04 for moderate sized rivers and streams and 0 0.04 to 0 0.25 for overbank flows. The flow observations used in developing the Manning N values have been confined to floods originating from precipitation runoff. The much greater magnitude of the dam breach flood produces greater velocities and results in the inundation of portions of the floodplain never before inundated within historic times. Also, the dam breach flood is much more capable than the lesser runoff generated flood of creating and transporting large amounts of debris, for example, uprooted trees, demolished houses, vehicles, etc. The higher velocities of the dam breach flood will cause additional energy losses due to the temporary flow obstructions formed by the transported debris which impinge against some more permanent feature along the river, such as a bridge or other man-made structure. Therefore, the Manning N values often need to be increased in order to account for the additional energy losses associated with the dam break flows, such as those due to the temporary debris dams, which form and then disintegrate when the water depths become too great. In summary, the uncertainty associated with the selection of the Manning N can be significant for dam breach floods due to, one, its variability with flow, two, the great magnitude of dam breach floods produce flow in portions of floodplains previously unobserved. This necessitates the selection of the N value without the benefit of previous evaluations of N from measured water elevations and flows, and three, the effects of transported debris can increase the Manning N. Although the uncertainty of the Manning N may be large, this effect is considerably reduced during the computation of the water surface elevations 
as illustrated in this graphic. Based on the Manning equation, the relationship between the error or uncertainty in the Manning N and the error in the resulting flow depth is as follows. A 60% error in the Manning N results in an error in depth of only 32% for a river valley with rectangular shaped cross sections. River valleys with wide gradually sloping floodplains are subject to even less error in the depth than those with rectangular cross sections. Thus for rivers with wide gradually sloping floodplains, an error of 60% in the Manning N results in only a 16% error in the depth of flow. This illustrates the degree of damping that can reduce the uncertainty in depth due to uncertainty in the Manning N. The propagation speed, C sub P of the flood, is related to the uncertainty in the Manning N, as illustrated in this graphic. A 60% error in the Manning N results in C sub P errors of 33% for river valleys with wide floodplains and 24% for rivers of rectangular shape. Thus, errors in the Manning N affect the rate of propagation more than the flow depth. But in each instance, the error is not proportional to the error in the Manning N, but rather the error is reduced. When the range of probable Manning N values is fairly large, a sensitivity test should be conducted using a dam breach flood routing model to simulate the flow, first with the lower estimated N values and then with the higher estimated N values. The resulting high water profiles computed along the river valley for each simulation represent a maximum and minimum envelope of possible flood peak elevations within the range of uncertainty associated with the estimated N values. Errors in the actual cross-sectional area due to selection errors, topographical map errors, etc., can also cause errors in the computed flow depth. Again, using the Manning equation, the depth errors resulting from errors in the cross-sectional area A are illustrated in this graphic. A 60% error in cross-sectional area results in a depth error of 60% for a rectangular-shaped river and an error of only 20% for a river with a wide valley. Dam breach floods can create a large amount of transported debris if it is available. The extent of the debris effects on the dam breach flooding is very dependent on the debris impinging on and blocking man-made or natural constrictions along the river valley. Transported debris may accumulate at constricted cross sections such as a bridge opening where the bridge deck and piers block the debris and the accumulated debris acts as a temporary debris dam which partially or completely restricts the flow. This causes the flow to pond or store behind the temporary dam. The maximum magnitude of the upper envelope of the flood peak elevation profile can be approximated by using a dam breach flood routing model to simulate the blocked constrictions. These are simulated as though they each were a hypothetical downstream dam having an estimated water elevation flow relation that approximates the gradual flow blockage. Also, each hypothetical downstream dam can be used to simulate the later rapid increase in flow due to the release of the ponded water when the debris dam is simulated as breaching. There is some uncertainty associated with flood volume losses that may be incurred as the flood propagates downstream and inundates wide and long floodplains, where large infiltration and detention storage losses may occur. These losses are difficult to predict. The conservative approach is to neglect such losses unless experience justifies their consideration. For example, previously observed flow losses associated with several large floods in the floodplain would be reason to include them in this simulation. The high velocity flows associated with dam breach floods can cause significant scour or degradation of the downstream of alluvial river cross sections. This possible enlargement in river cross sectional area is neglected in the model simulations since the equations for sediment transport and sediment continuity are not included among the governing equations of the flood wave and dam break models. The volume of scour in the floodplain is usually not significant compared to that in the riverbed and banks. This is due to the lesser flow velocities and the protective vegetative cover in the floodplain. The significance of the neglected alluvial river channel degradation is directly proportional to the river channel to floodplain conveyance ratio K sub C divided by K sub F. As the river channel to floodplain conveyance ratio increases, 
the degradation can cause a significant lowering of the actual water surface elevations. However, in many instances, this ratio is fairly small and remains small until at locations far downstream of the dam where the dam breach flood peak has attenuated significantly. Where this occurs, the maximum flow velocities have also attenuated. However, narrow rivers with minimal floodplains are subject to overestimation of water elevations due, due to significant river channel degradation. The alluvial fill or aggradation that occurs in the floodplain or in the river channel during receding flows have relatively small effects on the flood conditions. Some future research and developments are recommended in order to improve the general accuracy of predicting dam breach floods. First, use prototype physical experiments to develop breach models for embankment dams, including the complexity of both breach initiation time and formation time. Current efforts in this area are being conducted for clay embankment dams where head cutting failure mechanics are being studied. Similar studies need to be extended to other earth fill embankments such as silt loam embankments, sand gravel embankments, rock fill embankments, and embankments with a clay or concrete seepage prevention core. This information could be used to update the breach model. Also, efforts should be continued to predict the scouring capacity of dam crest overtopping waters to cause the failure of foundations of concrete dams. Secondly, determine the Manning inflow resistant values for dam breach floods using historical data from such floods combined with the use of physically based friction equations. Also, develop procedures to account for the flood debris blockage effects on Manning in values and the damming effect on bridge openings. Finally, develop methodologies such as Monte Carlo simulation coupled to a model such as the flood wave model to produce the inherent probabilistic features of dam breach flooding due to uncertainties in the reservoir inflows, breach formation, and downstream Manning in debris effects. Some of the primary aspects of dam breach modeling have been presented. A technique for simulating the breach formation using empirical statistical predictors for the average breach width W sub B and time of formation T sub F were combined with reservoir and spillway hydraulics to produce a dam breach hydrograph. This technique is a basic component of the dam break and flood wave models. An alternative approach of using the breach model based on erosion mechanics to simulate the dam breach hydrograph for earth fill dams was presented. A special hydraulic flood routing method was presented for predicting the attenuating peak flows, depths, and arrival times at locations downstream of the breach dam. This dynamic routing method is based on the numerical solution of the complete Sanvonet equations of one-dimensional unsteady flow. The capability was described for simulating the modifying effects of downstream structures such as bridges, road embankments, dams, and levees on the progression of the dam breach flood through the downstream river valley. The dynamic flood routing method is a basic component of the dam break and flood wave models. It was noted that the flood wave model can simulate a more complex system of downstream levees and interconnecting rivers than the single river and levee simulation capability of the dam break model. An alternative way was described for obtaining the downstream flood peak information by using the simple dam break model. This more convenient and simple approach is suitable for use when the flood modifying effects of the downstream structures and significant tributaries are absent and when a 10 percent error tolerance is appropriate. Several difficulties often encountered in the using the dam break and flood wave models were described and several ways were presented for averting the difficulties. These included proper selection of the numerical parameters delta x and delta t and the selection of spatial options for simulating transcritical flows and overbank flows in wide flat floodplains. Uncertainties in the selection of breach parameters, cross-sectional properties, and manning in friction coefficients were described, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Also, sediment and debris transport effects were briefly discussed. Finally, some future improvements for dam breach flood modeling were recommended. The suite of NWS dam breach models that have been presented provide a practical 
and generally accepted approach for obtaining the predicted properties of a potential dam breach flood that is unique to a particular dam, its expected mode of failure, and the particular characteristics of its downstream river valley. Often, the simple dam break model can provide useful dam breach flood information for preliminary decision making, such as the initial screening and classification of dam hazard potential. It can also serve to refine the boundaries, cross-section geometry, and other data required for input to the dam break or flood wave models. The flood wave model is the most comprehensive and powerful of the four models. When appropriate dam data are available, the combined use of the breach model, the statistical breach parameter predictors, and the flood wave model provides the best dam breach flood predictions available for preparation of flood inundation maps as well as other potential flood information for emergency action planners and dam safety decision makers. Thank you.